The book of James can be like a theological minefield. It's like you, you think you're all right, and you think you're gonna make it out without too much conviction, and then all of a sudden, you're gonna step on something. You're gonna step on something that explodes and reveals in your heart, uh, in your mind, these places where we've rebelled uh, against God, and yet God is faithful to expose those things, explode those things, so that we might see, confess, repent, and grow in our relationship with him. This is what James does. One of the most compelling, uh, mind-bending aspects of what the Bible teaches about the nature and character of God is, in one sense, his immensity, that, that there's nothing that is that he doesn't rightfully govern and know about. And so uh, the orbit of every planet in the universe, the temperature of every sun in the expanse of the universe, God knows it all, governs it all. All, and yet, in the midst of that immensity, he's dialed into things at the micro level. Not, not just every cell in every body, not just every plant on, on every um, landscape in the world and in other worlds, but the Bible says he has taken a special interest in us. And so let me read you two of those verses. In Luke chapter 12, verse 7, here's what Jesus has to say about this. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. So fear not. Why? Because God knows all the hairs on your head, for you are of more value than many sparrows. And so I'm looking around the room, and some of you are like, well, that isn't hard for the Lord to know all the hairs on my head, right? But, but here's the reality. Here's what's being taught in the scriptures, that in the midst of the immensity of God, God is dialed into us, made in his image, in a way where he knows every hair on our head. And if you don't have many of those, then let's, let's draw out the meaning of the text, which is when you had some, he knew all of those, and he knew when you had to go through that awkward stage where you didn't quite know, am I just shaving it? Am I combing it over? Am I, what am I doing with this? And you made that decision on into where you are today. Like God has known all of that. Psalm 139, verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So you have this God, this immense sovereign king of everything that's kind of dialed into you. All right? And he knows all the hairs on your head, and he knows all the days that would be shaped for you because he put you together in your mother's womb with your giftedness, with your personality, with who you are, and then he's got these days for you. And so what I don't want you to do in this moment is default to kind of the us. God knows about us. I want you to think about you. I rarely do this. I, I most often want to get your eyes off of you and onto the us, but for the purpose of this, listen, he knows the hairs on your head. Not our head, your head. He knows all the days that he has for you. Not for us, although that's true, but for you. So you need to personalize what the Bible is saying about God's interest in you. That he knows the hairs on your head. He knows the days that you would live in. In fact, he put you together and put those days together so that you might walk in the fullness of joy, bringing the greatest amount of glory to God. And then on top of that, you have these kind of spectacular claims about really what God's all about in regards to being dialed into those hairs and those days. In Psalm 16, 11, uh, the psalmist says this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now I love verses like this and there are dozens if not hundreds in the scripture because primarily what people think about God is that what God is after is a type of begrudging submission that we better do what he says for he lights us up and gives us cancer. And we better not be smiling and having a good time He'll stomp that out in a second. He ain't like that. He's holy. Quit grinning. But that's not what the Bible said. The psalmist says, you have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, pleasures 
in your right hand forevermore. Not the cheap kind of fleeting pleasures that we can enjoy for a moment that lead to guilt and shame, but the type of pleasure that never ceases. And then Jesus lays out the paths like this. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So what, what, what I need to get in your head and heart as we dive into James is that what God is after, what God is trying to do, what God is going to accomplish is he's trying to lead you into the deepest life possible, the richest, most full life imaginable. He is not the enemy of life. He is the author of it, and he is heaven bent on laying the path before you that leads to the fullest life possible. The sovereign king of glory is not a taker. He is a giver, and where he takes, he takes only to give. Now, how does he, this is the big question, how does God lead us into this life. If he's saying, the psalmist is saying, um, you you have led me, you have granted me um, fullness of life, and if Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, how does he lead us into full, rich, meaningful life? Well, he does it two ways. One is primary, the other is secondary, but necessary. Do you follow me? One is primary, the second is secondary, hence the second is secondary, but still a necessity. So there's not one of these pieces that isn't necessary, it's just that you've gotta understand them rightly. First and foremost, the way that God leads us into the fullest possible life is by revealing to us who he is, to gaze upon the beauty, glory, magnitude, and might of the creator God of the universe is what our hearts have been created for, and every other promise turns to ashes in our mouths. It is God and God alone that will satisfy the longings of our heart. The world swings around and goes, no, 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 no. You, you need a partner in life. You need a husband. You need a wife. You need a boyfriend. You need a girlfriend. You need money. You need a good job. You need, uh, you need this. You need that. And all of that betrays. All of that doesn't work in the end. They're all good things, but they're not ultimate things. You make them ultimate things, they're going to turn to ash in your mouth. You're going to spend all your days chasing the wind. No, what you need, what I need more than anything else is to behold the glory of God, to see his magnitude, his might, his power, his glory. We have been designed for this. Our hearts are restless until they see it. In fact, God is so about God that the Bible itself, first and foremost, is about God. It's not about you. How many of you grew up in church? So did you hear like this is the roadmap to life, right? Now, I don't want to dog that because there's some maps back here, okay? So I'm not dogging out the roadmap to life idea, except here's my problem with it. The Bible's not primarily about you. Now, it will reference you, but this is not the Lord kind of stroking your hair going, man, you are so amazing. I mean, I just, I just want to talk about you all the time. That would be soul-crushing, The Bible is about God because what we need most is to see him, behold his glory, get transfixed by it, and be led into the deep end of the pool. That's how this works. That's primary. That's what we need. That's what we were created for. We call this salvation. That the Holy Spirit opens up our heart to believe upon the person and work of Jesus Christ, reconciling us to God the Father and allowing us to behold the magnitude of the grace and mercy of God, rescuing and ransoming sinners from death. And that's primary. Secondarily, but also necessary, is on top of letting us see who he is, behold his glory and being transformed by it, he makes known to us the path of life. So he lays before us throughout the scriptures the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots. Now, here's what's important to note about the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots. What God is doing every time he gives a command is wooing or calling us into how he designed life to work. 
So when God says, thou shalt, he's trying to lead you into this life of abundance and depth and meaning and purpose and peace. And when God says, thou shalt not, he's not trying to rob you of anything. How would God be glorified if his big plan was begrudging submission on your part? If God's big plan was, man, I better do this or he'll light me up and take, maybe give me, get me sick, maybe hurt somebody, I better do what he says. The thou shalt not, or not God trying to take, but God trying to lead you to something that's going to bring you more joy than your idea of what's going to bring you joy will bring you. Now, the great thing about the book of James is the book of James is going to do both of these things simultaneously. It's going to show us the glory and might of God while simultaneously showing God going this way, this way to joy, this way to depth, this way to meaning, this way to peace. And we'll get to see both in one book. So you've got salvation. That's how God does it. That's how God woos us into fullest life. And then you've got obedience. Those are the two ways that God woos, God calls, God draws into this fullest life possible. Now, let's talk about the book of James just for a second. Who was, quick pop quiz, who was the book of James written by? Look at you guys. You, so proud of you right now. If somebody were going, Paul, I would have just resigned right here. I'd be like, I'm out, I'm out. Right, James wrote the book of James. Now, here's an interesting note about James. James is the half-brother of Jesus. And all the evidence we have is that while Jesus was doing his three years of earthly ministry, James did not think his half-brother was the son of God because that's what happens when you have a half-brother. You don't think they're deity. Not only that, but we have one instant in the Gospels where the Bible tells us that the half-brothers and sisters of Jesus showed up to seize him because they thought he had lost his mind. Because that's also what happens when your half-brother starts claiming that he's God in the flesh. And yet, about the time of Christ's death, James pushes all his chips in and says, my half-brother who I tried to have institutionalized, he's God, I take it back, he's God, I'm in. Now, what happens? Like, what card did Jesus play? You ready? Resurrection from the dead. <laughs> like, here's what convinces your half-brother that you're God. You die, stay that way for three days, and then show back up and eat some fish with him. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, because you see how James talks about Jesus, he, he says in this text that he is the servant of God and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this book, scholars would agree, this, this book is the earliest New Testament manuscript we have. This book was written in the 40s. No numbers in front of that. Try to no numbers in front of it, just 40s. All right, not 1040, 1140, 20, no, no, 40s. It was written in the 40s. It was written not long after the ascension of Christ and not long after Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen. The church is dispersed throughout the ancient world, planting other churches and establishing new congregations throughout um, the ancient landscape. This is written somewhere after the stoning of Stephen and the dispersion of the saints across the ancient world world. It was written to, and, and we see that in what we already read here, it was written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So that reference of the dispersion is, if you remember Acts, you, you had 3,000 men saved at Pentecost, and then 5,000 men saved just a couple of chapters later. So the church in Jerusalem, the Christian church in Jerusalem is running, um, let, let's, be, um, let's be safe in our estimations about 18, 21, 22,000 people in Jerusalem. They're enjoying favor. Christians are, are, men and women are becoming Christians every day until Stephen is stoned to death, the first Christian martyr. And the Bible tells us and history tells us that a great persecution broke out against the Christians in Jerusalem and they fled. And as they fled Jerusalem, they fled preaching the gospel to anyone who would hear and establish churches throughout the ancient Roman world. And so he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So these people that have been dispersed because of the persecution in Jerusalem. Now, 
He is right. This language of 12 tribes, it, it has, it, I mean, you cannot read 12 tribes and not think of Israel because Israel is on repeat throughout the scriptures described as the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, what we see in regards to biblical theology, an overview of what the Bible teaches is that James isn't just writing to Christian Jews, but rather his understanding and our understanding is that Israel, the chosen people of God, is now all all of those who have come to know Christ as Lord, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, Greek or Scythian, right? We are all the true Israel, that it's not ethnic Jews that are Israel, but rather all of those who are in Christ. So he is writing to the, the true church of God dispersed throughout the world James was written to encourage Christians in an increasingly hostile environment to live lives dependent on God and not give themselves over to the presumed comforts of the world. This is how the book breaks down. In chapter one, we'll see trials and Christian perseverance that'll move into hearing and doing the word of God. In chapter two, we look at the sin of partiality and the, and the relationship between works and deeds. In chapter three, we see the taming of the tongue and wisdom coming from God and not from our hearts. In chapter four, you get a warning against worldliness and boasting in tomorrow being arrogant. In chapter five, we see a warning against trusting in riches and comfort as a satisfier of the longings of our hearts. And we see a call to patient suffering and prayer. And that's the outline of the book of James. Now, when the, the church would have received this letter, that's what it is, it's a letter, um, that a runner, somebody who knew there was a church in this town would show up and they would deliver the letter and then the church would gather, it would look nothing like this. All right, it would be smaller. They would gather together in a house. They'd probably share a meal. And then the pastor would open up the letter from James, understanding that it is scripture, that it is authoritative. He would open it up and he would read it in one setting over the gathering. So they would eat a meal together. They would pray. They would sing songs. He would open up the letter in a given context, in a given place, with a given people. This context is a dispersion of people who are being persecuted walking in tragedy in the margins of this society, hated by their own ethnic group, hated by the predominant culture, marginalized, disrespected, suffering. And they would gather together and don't romanticize it. All the issues that are present today were there. There were women in that congregation that didn't like each other, that backstabbed all the time. There were men in that that were living duplicitous lives. There were teenagers in there wilding out. There was, I'm mean, gonna keep going. Don't over romanticize the early church. They were a train wreck, just like we are. They would gather and then they would just read the letter in one sitting. They, they would sit, they would gather around, everybody would have got something to eat, and they would just read the letter. Three things I wanted to draw your attention to in these five chapters. One, um, trials, suffering, difficulty can be expected. They do not surprise the heart of God. The way I've tried to teach this historically is simply by letting you know that God does not drive an ambulance. Do you understand what that means? An ambulance shows up after the accident and tries to put things back together. An ambulance shows up and goes, oh my God, we gotta try to save this life. That's not how God operates. He never shows up late. Now, what are we to do with that truth in light of our suffering? Well, the, the way I will point you for the rest of my days, as long as I have breath, is I'll point you to the cross of Christ. There is no greater objective evidence that God is for you, not against you, than the fact that Christ has come, he has died, and he has ransomed and rescued our soul from sin and death. We have ever before us the public crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection as the objective evidence that regardless of hardship and suffering, God is for us, not against us. We have not been abandoned. We, we see in the book of James, and this is why I love the book, if you live to be 170 years old. First, I don't think anybody wants that, but let's just say you get there and you read the book of James after 150 years of trying to faithfully follow Christ. You're gonna read through James and go, dang it, still not there. James exposes that we're not as far along as we think we are in this journey of sanctification. Man, even reading, even studying and getting ready for this series, I'm like, you know what? 
I still am not great with my mouth. I, I still will jab and tear down and, and justify. And, and you know what? I feel a pull in me. I feel a pull at, at times to show greater honor to those who can honor me back and not show honor towards those who can't. I feel that pull. I've got to fight it. God, why do I have to fight it? I know better than this. Uh, I like nice stuff. I'm drawn, I will buy into the lie that a nice vacation, a nice house, a nice car, nice things are gonna satisfy my heart. I'm pulled by these things. And James exposed it in me. It will expose it in you. And why that's good news is when we see we have so far to go, Christ is quick to step into that space and go, yep, that's what I'm here for. I got you, get back on. I'll carry you home. And, and that's what's good about the book of James. We're gonna see over and over again, that this is about progress, not perfection. Because if he gave you a thousand years, the tongue will still be not tamed fully. Now you might get better at it, right? But it'll still sneak up on you. It'll still sneak up on you. And then finally, you saw riches, comfort, these things will not satisfy the soul. The pull of the world to soft sell what the Bible teaches about life and practice will be ever present. It'll just be easier if I sell out. It'll just be easier if I kind of readjust what God said. God, you're making us look crazy down here. You're making us look crazy on how you define things, how you lay out obedience. That's great. Nobody thinks like that anymore, God. Throw us a bone here. Need a bit of a makeover. Help us out. The tendency to sell out for the world's approval will be a constant pull and an ever-increasing pull in the decades to come. James will try to drop an anchor for us. Friday night, Audrey's birthday, it was me in a minivan full of 11-year-old girls driving out to the Fort Worth Stock Show uh, and Rodeo uh, to watch the rodeo. That I, Is anything about me oozing, this guy loves the rodeo? Right, but I'm laying my yes down because the memories that I want my daughter to have is my dad was for me. He loved me. And there were those days that I have to sit my kids down that buck against the what's and the why's now. And I've got to say, you're grounded. I've got to say, give me that. Now I'm doing all of that. And I'm doing all of that because I'm 40. And they're 12 and 9 and 5. And at 40, I see better than they do about how we should walk this thing for their joy. Not always for their happiness, but for their joy, for deep, meaningful, rich life. And at 40, I can go, oh God, if you go down that path, baby, you go down that path, this ends badly. Son, you take that route, it ends horrifically. This way, buddy, this way to life, this way. And I'm pleading with them for their own joy. And they're not gonna see it that way. Gosh, even this week, they didn't see it that way. But I'm dad, so I'll take a little bit of being despised for an hour or two to get us to life. The book of James is our heavenly father going, this way, this way, come on. No, 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 don't do it. Listen, I'm eternal. You're like 50. Eternal 50 in the equation. You're the five-year-old in Chandler's illustration. I'm the dad, this way. I'm going, oh, gosh, I just don't think you understand. You know, I'm 26. I don't think you, you know what I've been through, being God and all. <laughs> my life would be easy if I could just do whatever I wanted, you know, in my godness. You don't, you don't understand, right? So James is like, hey, no, 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 come on. This way, this way to life, this way to meaning, this way to depth, this way to purpose, this way to the fullest life possible. I've come, you might have life and have it more abundantly. You have made known to me the path of life. You have filled me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life more abundantly. That's the invitation from God through our brother James.